Okay, well, uh, Debashish is last, and uh, you get to refute anybody you like today, <laughs> Debashish. <laughs> but of course, Debashish is not into refuting, but uh, framing these larger uh, teachings of Sri But I guess today you're going to give us, the, you know, the kind of a comparative view and yeah. perhaps on the post-human <laughs> manifesto, so thank well, you. Th thank you, Bowman. Uh, actually, uh, this is part of what I'm working on at present, so it's not really well-formed. It's still in, 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 in process. And so it's, it's really a more like a sharing than a kind of a finished paper or finished set of ideas. Did Jim, something happen to Jim? Yeah. So I, actually I'm, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Kundal and I think some of your ideas were very, very interesting and actually of course, um, and some of them coincide with some of the things that I was going to say, particularly uh, the dualism of the Western tradition, which uh, a lot of contemporary philosophers are aware of and so they're trying to address it particularly through uh, notions of ontogenesis and individuation, you know, seen as a single process rather than a duality. Um, <clears throat> uh, what, what's brought me to this, and actually there was an error in the, in the, in the, in the title that I sent you. Uh, it's really about Gilbert Simondon. I, I'm, I said Gilles Simondon, and that's a kind of a funny hybrid between Gilles Deleuze and Gilbert Simondon. Gilles Deleuze is sort of like a closet disciple of Gilbert Simondon, so I think he'll be happy at that <laughs> you know, mistake. Um, uh, to start with, uh, <clears throat> why the comparison with Sri Aurobindo at all? So Sri Aurobindo gives us a very, very comprehensive integral, which is the word that he liked to use for, 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 for his view of vision, um, view of reality. <clears throat> it's framed by him in different ways in different texts. Uh, and these texts have different uh, you know, intentions and different kinds of uh, audiences and different disciplinary uh, modalities in mind. So we can talk about a metaphysics, we can talk about a psychology, we can talk about a theology, and we can talk about a philosophy of history, a sociology and a philosophy of history. And each of these is a different text, as it were. They all wrap together into an integral vision, but they are presented differently. So if we are to think about, you know, if, if it's, it's a very uh, sort of daunting job to try and summarize any of these, but if one was to try to essentialize, you know, to kind of do that bad thing called essentializing <laughs> Sri Aurobindo, um, you know, we can look at the different things and talk about various ways in which he has tried to present them. So for a metaphysics, we can say that the metaphysics is really one of the self-manifestation of Brahman. And so there is <clears throat> reality, Brahman, conscious being, who is infinite, radically infinite. And I think that's a very important thing when you talk about the one, uh, oneness. Because whenever we say oneness, we are looking at the one from the finite point of view as some kind of a super instance, a numerical one. But this is better thought of as a radically infinite reality. And this radical infinity <clears throat> can turn on itself to know itself. It has a certain knowledge of itself which is self-evident, just as we have a knowledge of ourselves that we cannot put into words. You know you are, you know, I am. So that, that self-evident, knowledge of self-evidence is intrinsic to it. But it also has awareness, consciousness, which it can turn on itself to know itself in a form of what we call knowledge, with a, with a capital K. Now, 
if it does that, it's infinity looking at infinity. Th that immediately you have two infinities looking at each other. And hence, the other infinity is as infinite as itself. This is why you can think about it as a duality. It becomes the two in one. That's a term Sri Aurobindo sometimes uses to talk about these two things called you know, Brahman and Maya. Or if it is to be thought of as a person, an infinite person, which the Hindu tradition does, and kind of foregrounds in the Gita as the, as the, as the Vishwarupa, uh, it is the infinite person, incomprehensible by the finite, who turns upon its himself, so it's the, then it's the Ishwara, and the turning upon is that of the Shakti, the Ishwara and the Shakti. So Brahman, Maya, Ishwara, Shakti. <clears throat> Now, when it does that, it immediately creates a representation of itself. So that representation can always be, you know, a certain representation. In other words, there can be infinite representations of itself. Now, each of these representations of itself spawns a process of self-exploration, which will be eternal or perennial. It, there's no end to it because it is radically infinite. So it will keep on exploring itself. So a world is spawned, a cosmos is spawned, that infinite cosmoses can be spawned thus. Now, that turning upon itself can also be done with a certain principle. Now, if that principle is a principle of intelligence, then we have vijnana. But what, what Sri Aurobindo, the term, that's the term he translates as supermind. Supermind is a systematic way of exploring itself, rather than any way of exploring itself. So to create a systematic way of self-exploration, you have to first deny yourself. You have to start from ground zero. So self-denial is the first step of a systematic self-exploration. And then from that self-denial, there arises the gradations of consciousness. It, it, it's also in another way, he talks about it as a objectification of the self. In other words, that which is subject looks upon itself as object. As soon as it looks upon itself as pure object, it seems not to be. It seems as if it's unconscious. And yet its consciousness is latent and starts emerging out of that. But this is a metaphysics. And yet in that metaphysics, he kind of talks about that those emergences as emergences ultimately of the one being that is appearing in a multiple form. So it's not just from consciousness to unconsciousness, this self regard is a multiple self-regard. So there, there are infinite ways of looking at itself at the same time. And each one is, you may use the later terminology and say each one of these regards is a soul. So this spawns the multiplicity which will then evolve perennially, you see. Now, this is the metaphysics. This is, of course, it's much more complex. You can say many more things about it. Uh, you can talk about the relationship of Brahman and Maya, Ishwara and Shakti, Vidya and Avidya, what is known as the knowledge and the the, the, the knowledge and the ignorance. But essentially, this is the framework for the metaphysics. <clears throat> now, within this metaphysics, there exists the psychology which is the psychology of the evolution of the entire cosmic reality. And within it, each of these souls, which you may call persons. So the evolution of the cosmic reality is the evolution of Prakriti. And the evolution of each of these souls is the evolution of Purusha. Two kinds of evolutions are going on. And this connects to the theology, which is that of the sacrifice of Purusha. And Sri Aurobindo says that the notion of the sacrifice of Purusha comes to us from the Veda, but actually preceding the sacrifice of Purusha is the sacrifice of the Divine Mother, what he calls the Holocaust of the Divine Mother, which is ultimately what makes what Kundan was saying so important that the Mother becomes the transformative energy that can guide 
this evolution into areas that it has not yet explored. So these are the elements that go into the, uh, in, into the theology, the theology and the metaphysics. Then there is a philosophy of history. In other words, this process, this evolutionary process, is taking place according to a certain structure. And structuring time, he goes back to a certain extent. This is, this is the wonderful thing about Sri Aurobindo. His roots are hybrid. And he'll, he'll say that. So because on the one hand, he's looking at the four stages of the yugas. On the other hand, he's looking at the German philosophers who are talking about philosophies of time. And he's translating it into terms. And in the record of yoga, he's actually getting these. He's writing down that yeah, I was reading this philosopher today, and I saw that this maps. And it's the symbolic age, the conventional age, the age of individualism, and the spiritual age. The intermediate age is the subjective age. Okay. So these, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just, if, if there are questions afterwards, I can take it up. But these, these are the basic structures. And then it's a cyclical structure. So it, there is a spiral. These four um, succeed each other. And then the first spirals back in, into a greater realization. And it's an infinite realization. So there are continuous uh, sets of fours that are sp spinning off. And then the structure of time or structure of history is not linear. Within each of them, again, each of the four. So it's like a fractal uh, you know, structure of time. So th this is the broad picture. And then out of that, he comes into the whole idea of our time being a special time. Now, this becomes a very important issue because it reappears in a number of other philosophies. It re reappears in theosophy, for example. And you were talking about Alice Bailey, et cetera. It reappears in a number of other philosophies uh, that believe that we are in a very special time. So for him, and then we have the under, uh, other integral philosophers, like Gebser, for example, for whom also this becomes a very important time. And for Sri Aurobindo, there is a kind of a, 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 one may say there is, there is a certain degree of convergence with people like Gebser, because he's also talking about the fact that from around the re period of the Renaissance, we enter into what he calls the cycle of reason. The cycle of reason sort of takes us into the modern age. Now, that's where this abstract cycle of time or structure of history becomes concrete and starts relating to us. And so we start seeing that we are in the middle of this transition, according to him, where the cycle of reason is reaching its end. And we are entering into what he calls the subjective age. Now, he kind of talks about this in two major texts. One is, of course, his uh, his, his uh, ideal of human unity. Human cycle is the one way. Ideal of human unity, he's seeing it in political terms. But the other work is the future poetry, where also he's seeing us entering into a cultural age, which is really the age of modernism. I mean, he's talking about it in the early modernist period. But he's seeing it as a entry into a subjective age. Now, the subjective age he is foreseeing will take us into a spiritual age. Now, in a certain sense, looked at in terms of long durations, you know, the history of long durée, we do see that there probably is some kind of a movement of that kind that's occurring. But it's not a simple movement. It's not a linear movement. And in between that subjective age that he was talking about and the spiritual age that he was foreseeing, he himself saw that a spanner was thrown in the works during his own lifetime, which was the Second World War. So a very major spanner was thrown into the works. That he, in, in, in a number of places, he says that his work was seriously um, impacted by that event. He was not expecting it to happen. 
So this is the background. What I wanted to say is, since time is short, I just wanted to say that these different texts give us an integral view, but the integral view is not put together in one text or through one language. And one of the problems that has occurred due to that in the post Sri Aurobindo and the mother period is that people who follow Sri Aurobindo usually completely neglect the historical and temporal aspect, uh, except for taking it as some kind of triumphalism of the new age. <laughs> Or they look at the metaphysics uh, and the, the theosophical parts sort of like some kind of religion. And then to some extent what has happened is that the yoga is privileged in terms of whatever uh, I think Jim was saying, there is no particular method to the yoga. And in fact, Sri Aurobindo says that in, in the synthesis of yoga, he's got a sentence saying, what is his method? He's talking about the guru. And he says, he has no method and all methods, right? But then there are ways by which he does talk about a method. And if you were to put it in simple terms, it's what he calls the triple transformation. And, and in a certain place, he even calls it a quadruple transform. There are four stages to the transformation in one particular place in the synthesis. So that process is a very important process. And people do try to look at that, those who want to follow the yoga of Sri Aurobindo. But what is lost sight of is the habitus, the social habitus the way in which the world impacts the yoga and the yoga impacts the world, that has caused a certain kind of problem. If you look at Sri Aurobindo and the mother's own lives, their political decisions were impeccable. It's, these are two teachers who never made a mistake at, about what was going on in the world. Even when the Second World War happened, all around them, there were disciples who were thinking they ought to side with Germany because they were against Britain. And India was trying to get out from underneath the, the British. And both of them came out really strong. And remember, Sri Aurobindo fought the British during his early years. And he said, if you think that by siding with Germany, you're doing a favor of any kind, know that it's really a betrayal of both me and the mother. He used really strong terms. So the thing is here, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is that the ethical context and the understanding of the relationship between our time and its needs and the yoga is not clearly understood by people following the yoga today, partly because the texts are separate and are not read together to make sense together. Now, this paucity, this problem, has been experienced in other ways in other cultures as well. And I think the reason he did that is because modernist epistemology is specialized. It works through disciplines. And he was answering these various disciplines in separate disciplinary manners. But from around the, what we call modern uh, period, the modern epistemological system makes, starts making its appearance felt from, from the time of Husserl. And Husserl was actually looking for a language which would talk about these two things at the same time which would talk about man and his place in history at the same time, his place in society, intentionally situated place in society at the same time. Now this becomes even more um, clearly articulated by Heidegger. And then with people like Michel Foucault, you start getting a kind of um, historicized uh, you know, account of the human being. In other words, it's genealogy and archaeology that determine the ideologies through which we live. We are being determined by these forces. Now, we may have something outside of what determines us, but we can't escape 
the circles of what tie us together as, as the forces of history. So that kind of understanding of that kind of way of speaking about the human being as somebody who even in his everyday life is actually a product of history and is engaged with history in everything that he says and does is I'd say a post Sri Aurobindo phenomenon. It's it's happened. It's a, I, I speak of it in these terms because there is the necessity to create a new kind of language, and that language has emerged after Sri Aurobindo's time. So that is that is one thing. That's one reason why it's important. I feel to address some of the things he says in a new language. Now. However, there's another tradition from which new languages of this kind have come. Now, the whole tradition that we are talking about, the Husserlian or post-Husserlian tradition, is actually a post-Kantian tradition. It really comes out of Kant. But there is another post-Nietzschean tradition. And that, of course, converges. And people like Foucault are very strongly Nietzschean figures. But you also have. The, the reason I'm talking about Nietzschean tradition in thinking man and his place in history at the same time is because here we start having the notion of ontogenesis. Okay, the idea just as we can talk about um, ab about um, you know the sacrifice of prakriti and the yoga of nature and the yoga of the purusha, the yoga of prakriti and the yoga of the purusha. In a, as a relationship at all times. So too we can talk about a certain process, an evolutionary process, through which individuation is occurring. It's a historical process through which individuation is occurring. A number of thinkers have be begun thinking like that. And one of them, of course, is Henri Bergson. He was uh, one of the uh, contemporaries of Sri Aurobindo, who starts thinking in terms of becoming, uh, the philosophy of process and the philosophy of becoming, duration, as he calls it, uh, history as a process, and the individual as engaged with that at any time. Now, some people over here at CIIS, I'm thinking of Eric Weiss, for example, uh, have looked at uh, Whitehead as a process philosopher through whom to study Sri Aurobindo. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting uh, exercise and needs more work because that's one of the ways in which these new languages can be created. Uh, <clears throat> but the person that I'm, uh, I was going to talk about that, that I find particularly interesting is Gilbert Simondon. Gilbert Simondon is like a chain, a link in the chain which straddles uh, Bergson and Gilles Deleuze. He's right in the middle. And he gets from Bergson the idea of evolution, but he gets it in a different way. And because of his situation in time, he died in 1989, by the way. A lot of new ideas constellate. The idea of chaos and complexity, of autopoiesis, uh, these kinds of ideas constellate in his work. But, you know, if I were to essentialize Simon Don, basically what he's saying is that the cosmos is trying to individuate itself. And it's trying to individuate itself in all the various ways possible. And this individuation process it's become, it's like in each of its instances, he talks about it as neg entropy, right? The negative entropy, because the, 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 the race against death, okay? So instances that will arise, that will persist, that will become self-regulating organisms that have a persistence power. And each of these forms of individuation are actually trying not only to just survive against the drive to wipe them out, but to become cosmos. In other words, in some way or the other, to become uh, fully embodied as cosmos. And he also identifies stages in that, which are related to the evolutionary appearances of principles of being. In other words, there's a material, and he uses the term vital because he gets it from Bergson, 
and he uses the term psychic, but he uses the term psychic in terms of subjective. He, he doesn't have the same psychic content as Sri Aurobindo and the mother have, but he's using the same term. So there is a physical individuation, a vital individuation, and a psychic individuation. But here is where he goes one step further to think about the milu, the individual and the collective at the same time. So there is a process of history, and we are at a certain cusp in that process of history. And at the same time, individuation is taking place. It has taken place in matter and the highest forms. And again, that's where it maps to some of the things the mother says. It's in crystals that you find the most developed individuations of matter, for example, in, in, his, in his case. And then you have vital uh, individuation that is taking place in plants and animals. And then you have psychic individuation that begins in the human, but that co continues the physical and vital indiv individuation processes as well inside the human. But the psychic individuation to complete itself also needs to develop a collective reality. So the I and the we are co-creators so he calls that trans-individuation. So there is a psychic individuation and a trans-individuation that are going on at the same time. And where Simon Don brings in something, he's one of the early originators and very far-seeing originators of the philosophy of contemporary technology. Because here is where he brings in something again. The Sri Aurobindo died in 1950. And it's only after 1960 and perhaps after 1980 that we see this tremendous acceleration to the point where our culture is technological culture. It's embedded in everything. We are mediated by technology completely. And this is only going to increase. So what is the place of technology in our lives? This becomes a very important question for yoga. You know, what, what does it mean? Are we just going to act as if it isn't there? Are we going to act as if it's a bad thing and we need to go back to the forests and the caves? Or are we going to act as if, oh, it's the best thing that's happened and it's going to solve all our problems? And, you know, Simon Don is, is, is a very, so he, the thing is, very little of him has been translated. And whatever has been translated only exists in bootleg forms. But if you check the web, you'll find translations of his work. He wrote in French, of course. Uh, his PhD thesis, which was done in the 50s, um, is called On the Mode of Existence of Technical Objects. And what he wrote after that was about individuation, psychic and collective individuation. That is the other work. And if you look at this, the work on, on and after that, of course, he was a professor in Sorbonne, and he gave a number of lectures, some of which uh, have been translated. And if you look at his work, in a nutshell, what he's saying is that technology is a boon and a curse. And it also goes through the process of individuation. And for him, of course, it doesn't have an independent existence outside of the human. It's, it coexists with the human. But it has a life of its own as well. And once, and as he points out, you know, that, that happens to all our cultural artifacts. Language, for example. We create language, but once we've created language, language develops a life of its own. It starts as if developing individuality and trying to become cosmic. Language itself becomes cosmic. So he's saying the same thing with technology, and it goes through phases. And he says the entire phase of industrial technology is an alienating phase, and that's what we've we have, we've just passed through. And in the 60s, he's saying we're just about to pass into another phase of technology, which will be characterized by two 
uh, ideas. One is the idea of the ensemble. In other words, it's no more going to be big machines, but it's going to be many machines that are in communication with each other, forming networks, and ultimately moving in a direction where all machines are in communication with each other. He's saying that in the late 60s. And he's saying that the second idea is the reduction of the footprint, the disappearance of the behemoth, right? It will, it will reduce its footprint to a point where you'll have terminals of pluripotence. In other words, small little terminals which will allow you to access any machine anywhere to do anything you want. Wow. See? <laughs> right. And, and wow. that's the amazing thing. He was seeing this in the 1960s. <laughs> and he was saying that when that happens, it's no longer a machine that you'll be in contact with. You'll be in contact with the cosmic being of technology. So that's, that's the way in which he was going. Now, what does that mean for us? Then? So it comes, again, it comes back to the curse and the blessing. And we see today, and there are philosophers who have followed, one of the major ones is Bernard Stiegler. He's the S-T-I-E-G-L-E-R, Stiegler. Uh, he's also a French philosopher, a contemporary, who's done a lot of work based on Simon Don. And essentially he's saying it's much more a curse than a blessing, even, in, even if it does what he's saying it, it's going to do, because of the, the enormous power of capitalistic uh, conditioning that it will lend itself to. But on the other hand, it could be a blessing if we do the integral yoga. That's, that's the point. So that ultimately, what is it that we want from that ensemble? If we have agency, which is cosmic, then we can get from it that which is cosmic. And that can be a co-evolutionary process. If it is, we can use our own yoga as a means, or as a sort of a channel of co-evolution with this evolving ensemble of machines. See? Uh, I mean, it may sound esoteric, but just to give a sort of a kind of an uh, obvious sounding example, uh, the person who doesn't know what they want gets inundated by the computer today. They're, they're sort of moving from place to place, browsing all kinds of things, and in the process, spilling a lot of information which will be used to target them. See. On the other hand, the person who knows what they want, because they have the internal structures, can get a lot out of it, can actually contact the cosmos through it. See, So it's, it's that difference. But to get to the second point, you need to have a subjectivity. You need to be cosmic yourself in a subjective sense. So it's really. The, ob the universe or the cosmic consciousness is becoming objective. In a way, it's becoming material. Matter is housing the cosmic consciousness. On the other side, we have to embody the cosmic consciousness. The subject has to have the cosmic consciousness to match the cosmic consciousness of objective material reality. This is me. <laughs> so that's basically my <laughs> notebooks <laughs> entry. Go through that last paragraph. Just the part about the subject. Yeah, can you just subject that? That? Nothing is repeatable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Bernard Stiegler. Stiegler. Okay. Yeah. S T I E G L E R. Okay. Bernard Stiegler. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. I can't get this working. Yeah, my battery is up, but please go ahead and oh, oh. we'll talk talk louder. Or, 
Or, yeah, well, yeah. Techno Man is in charge, so. Try again. Should I just turn it on and. Uh, Why don't you use this? Oh, okay. okay you're, you're you're gonna use this. Yeah, okay, good. The speaker is the one that mentioned that you have to be integral yoga. No, no, he doesn't mention integral yoga. Okay. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he, Stiegler is saying that, I just want to get that clear. okay, uh, in, in essence, Stiegler is saying it's very dangerous, it's even more dangerous. What this guy is talking about is going to happen, it will happen, but it's going to be even more dangerous because it will lend itself to much more powerful forces of conditioning. Mm -hmm. This is what he, He's calling it mnemotechnics, the technologies of memory. And he's saying, in a real-time sense, everything that any of us is saying or doing is being recorded by something or the other. And it's being stored as a tertiary form of memory that is becoming available all over for use against you. See. So that, that works in with some of Pyramid's ideas about the divine, the anti-divine. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So the divine in all this has to be generated within us because left to itself, it will be just used by the anti-divine. Yeah, this is very profound. One second, I think we have a question there. The Vashida, in fact, you know, Sri Aurobindo is talking about this in the quote that I read. Yeah. So I want to read yeah, that, please. You know, that sentence, actually. Um, and this is not a paragraph, actually. It's just a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Much that can now be known, worked out or created by the use of invented tools and machinery might be achieved by the new body in its own power or by the inhabitant spirit through its own direct spiritual force. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was saying that. He also says in the Life Divine this thing about miniaturization. He's talking about telegraphy, right? So this is when there's no, not the telegraphs. And he's saying that uh, one of the whole aims of technology is to reduce the interface and make it smaller and smaller. He said to go to the vanishing point. So that's what he's talking about. So yeah, technology can become internal technology ultimately, or, but it's also a process. It's a co-evolutionary process. It's almost as if we've exteriorized, and Marshall McLuhan was talking about this. We are constantly exteriorizing the capacities we don't have in machines, but as we develop our subjectivity, we can reclaim that technology more and more. So it's almost a co-evolution that ultimately makes the machine disappear in the self. I think Google Glass is probably you think of that kind of. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think some other questions, the gentleman. Right. And I'm thinking there's the 1% that want to control all the information, he has the 10%. You know what I mean? Right. Say something a little bit about that, thinking about that Ratio. dialogue between those that like to be in control of all of it yeah. and those that would like to transform it all. Why yeah, I no, think? I think that's a, that's a very, very thought-provoking sort of ratio, because you're right. And it's, it's that whole thing about the 99% against the 1%, right? And it is true, it's, that's, that's why Stiegler is saying it's the 1% that controls so much clout in the world that undoubtedly they're going to, they're going to be the persons who will use it against you. So, that, and exactly the 10% thing that you're talking about. So, what he's saying is essentially, you know, there's the I, there's the them, which is you use the word blah or ba ba or whatever, you know, the sheep are there. And, you know, who, who, are, who are ready to be harvested, basic, basically. You know, they, they're up for grabs and they don't care. And th that's the majority. You know, they, they don't, they're just there to receive whatever is given to them as a form of entertainment. 
And you know, there's the, 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 we, I just attended a post-humanism conference in which somebody gave a really good talk about the kinds of dystopias that we are faced with. And there are two major types. There's George Orwell's dystopia, which is, you know, a conditioned, um, a sort of a, a, a kind of a totalitarian state. But there's the other dystopia, which is the liberal dystopia, where you're gaga all the time because you're being given over choice, but you're being used all the time by somebody else to milk your money and whatever else intelligence you have. You see? And just as a, if I could just say then, so each of us then has to get nine other people to get into the collective realm. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's it. So basically, you're absolutely right. So basically what he's saying is, between the us and the them is the we. And each of us has to have a we, which is essentially a, a kind of an island, an oasis, and it doesn't need to be physically situated, it can be even cyber, but which is that kind of island that causes new uh, formations to take place and resist that, uh, that other formation. Yeah. That's part of the politics. He calls it new politics. New NOO, you know, like, uh -huh. like the new sphere. Yeah, politics of intelligence. Uh -huh. Yeah. Have you looked into the works of Alvin Toffler? And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so Toffler was writing actually that things like Future Shock, etc. Yeah. The, 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 see, he was he was a future. He was the first futurist, you may say. Yeah. But yeah, I, but I think these are much deeper philosophically than Toffler's work. Toffler was more like a sociologist of, of, the, of the future. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you were talking about uh, negentropy, yeah. um, I thought of Rupert Sheldrake's concept of, of habits. Yes. That actually there aren't, uh, the universal constants are not constant, they're just habits that the universe develops, yes. but they can be accumulative so that there's a growth, there's an, an evolution in that sense, right. us uh, fighting against what we understand as, as energetic entropy, right. uh, building up instead. Right. So, um, so that, that would extend into the, the biological. Yeah. And it occurs to me that if, if Sri Aurobindo and the mothers uh, say that it's our, it's our task, duty, mission as human beings to uh, spiritualize and, and awaken matter, then, you know, in some sense, we've already begun that process through this, this technology. Tech, technology. Yeah, yeah, technology. You're, you're right there. Uh, but you know, there's another another uh, aspect to this negentropy business, which is individuation, because individuation, and then because these people are not theologians by even a long stretch. Somebody like uh, Simon Don, and they belong to the agnostic tradition, so they're not going to talk about God. But nevertheless, there's a lot of mysticism in his work. But you can map this very easily into the whole theology of the sacrifice of Purusha and the reconstitution of Purusha. So if there is a reconstitution of Purusha going on, then indeed what is happening is that souls are being born and kind of moving towards this kind of mastery. And this, the mas that, that process of the soul's mastery over nature, which Sri Aurobindo is saying is the goal of integral yoga, is negentropy. That, uh, that is the ultimate negentropy. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah, Linda. Very quick, quick. This isn't even on, is it? Yeah, it's on, it's on. Okay, so um, I just wanted you to restate that bombshell of a conclusion, which was, um, you said, uh, matter is becoming conscious and we need to, uh, the cosmic consciousness is becoming material. Right. Matter is becoming conscious. We need to develop cosmic consciousness to what? Okay, I said, I said the con cosmic consciousness is becoming material and therefore objectivized. We need to embody cosmic consciousness as the subject. Yeah. 
that is the undertaking of the integral yoga. And this we can do, so if we look at it in an isolated manner, that's what the integral yoga is doing. But if we recognize this fact, we can co-evolve. In other words, we by? can do it in a way which utilizes this process of becoming cosmos of matter to become cosmos ourselves. It's a kind of a co-evolutionary process. What do you mean by we, mean we need to embody cosmic consciousness as subject? What do you mean by that again? Well, that, yeah, universalize, universalize yourself as, uh, as a being. And what's the difference between that and the cosmic consciousness in matter? Well, cosmic consciousness in matter is available to you, but there's no being there, right? It's, it's, it's basically, uh, say, cyberspace can give you access to any point in the cosmos, can give you functional and epistemological access, but there is no being there. Or if there is a being there, it doesn't have the kind of subjectivity that you have. It has a kind of subjectivity. That's what Simon Don is saying, but it's completely absent or alien from what you have. I think you totally need to write like a major work on this. <laughs> totally. Well, I, I'm, awesome. I'm headed towards uh, an article at least. Yeah. Yes, sir. I want to read. I want to be your first reader. Yeah. yeah. Question. Well, this is your, it's actually it's your response. Yeah. Your yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there is a. Is this on? Yeah, it's okay. on. There is a branch in in the Western Western esoteric tradition that um, matter as the third principle and consciousness as the second principle, you know, and spirit is the first principle. That that you know we are actually <coughs> consciousness, the consciousness aspect uh, embodied and and the process of mastery, but that the technology is that third principle and sometimes called the devic life or uh, devic uh, intelligence. And that our process as consciousness is one of interacting. It's a co-evolutionary process between consciousness and matter. And this is where we have to develop the recognition that this is what is happening so we don't get overrun by. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Is it on? Yeah. OK. Um, so I don't know your name, but. You were mentioning between the individual and the they. Yeah. There's the we. Yeah. And uh, earlier on, there was a, a climate change panel, and one of the, what was his name, Craig? Is that his name? Craig. Talked about something called eridime rather than paradigm, uh -huh. which he was he was characterizing as a larger shift than a paradigm shift, which is sort of specific to some. Uh, some area, yeah, and and it seems like in Aerodyne is the way that that we gets developed. So it's a we that accesses. In, in, what I'm thinking is that it's a we that accesses the the cosmic consciousness in each in in all of the individual subjectivities uh, that participate, yeah, and, and a way and and you know kind of a collective way of of uh, creating the intelligence that can make use of in, in, in with intelligence of of this technology yeah i was i was present for that talk and <coughs> you know i remember he also said something about being the first member of a certain community which does not yet exist and i i, I took that to heart because that's really true it's, those are the communities that don't yet exist that need to exist that's what the whole thing is about those are the 10 that collective practice <laughs> right. It's not easy. It's not easy. But one has to make but an it, effort towards crystallizing those. But I think that, that taking a topic <coughs> that is of concern that people can just, um, and, and I mean, making use of, um, you know, Connie was talking about bone dialogue as well, yeah. where, where, you know, you make use of that open space yeah. to access the, the, the spiritual collective of the participants and just let, <coughs> let it begin to emerge and yeah. allow it to continue to emerge. <coughs> Uh, 
Okay, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but I think I know what's going on. <laughs> this is great, and uh, you woke us all up, Tobishish. Thank you so much. All right, well.